All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Whitetail Edge podcast. I'm here with my buddy, Kurt Geyer from Working Class. What's up, man? Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How you doing this morning? I'm good, man. We're doing an early, mo early morning podcast on this one, which is kind of nice. Pretty much like talk radio in the morning. <laughs> right. It is. Yeah. It's as close as you get without uh, being as crummy as the radio sometimes. We're pretty crummy, <laughs> but not radio crummy. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how was your Christmas, man? It was great. It was yeah. great. Time awesome. with the fam. Took some time off, which was mm -hmm. nice, but yeah, it was good. How about yours? Yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, we got hit with some crazy weather and uh, it was nuts. Um, I don't think I've ever seen temperatures that cold in Ohio in my life. You know, a lot of deer died this last weekend up until last night. Um, I mean, I it went nuts, which I was, it was cool to see. It's like, man, guys are continuing the hustle through Christmas. And that's just something that I, I can't really recall another year when I saw that many deer get killed over like Christmas weekend. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's been a long time since I've seen it like that too. Um, excuse me. My dad, uh, he capitalized and uh, I saw shot, that. shot the biggest deer of his life. That thing, uh, Buckmaster scored that at 196. No kidding. Your yeah. family's on fire this year, man. Dude, it was insane, man. Um, yeah. Between me, my brother, my dad, and my mom. We all wrapped our tags around uh, 170 inch or, or bigger. That's got to be for a family to do that with their I mean, mom. Yeah, mom included. That's not very common, man. That's a pretty special thing right there. So, congrats to you guys. That's an incredible season. Yeah, thank you. And I, I don't want ever want it to like come across as arrogant, but I mean, it's definitely <laughs> something to be proud of. Yeah, you know, honestly, even if you guys all killed like just Pope and young bucks, like still a really amazing season. Then you go, okay. Yeah. 140 bucks, still an amazing, and you guys incredible season. Like it doesn't get better. Yeah. I don't want to say this and put this on you, but topping the season you guys had collectively as a family is going to be tough to beat after this year. Oh no, totally. I totally agree. Go watch dad, do it uh, next year. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> My dad, um, my dad sat out there in like negative 40 degree wind chills. Uh, you know, dad's had a heart attack and cancer and stuff like that. So, man, I was kind of worried that he was even sitting out there to, right. begin with, you know, but um, kudos to him, man, for, for toughing it out and getting her done. It was pretty, pretty awesome. awesome. That's very, very awesome. Yeah. And that, that deer in particular, um, we've had him since uh, 2018 and uh, believe he was five and a half then just looking at his body. So dude, this deer is ancient. Like, wow. We're definitely sending the jawbone in. Okay. Got to get aged. Um, just because looking at pictures this year, um, you couldn't really tell that that deer was that old. Mm -hmm. It's definitely that old. I mean, he was, yeah. he's an unmistakable deer. He had a, he was blind in one eye. He's got this crazy brow time that he's had for years. Um, Very cool. Know, so like undoubtedly him, but it's like, if you didn't know any better and you saw that picture from this year, you would never guess that deer was pushing 10 years old. After a certain age, I just think like they almost go backwards. You know, you see pictures like, you know, guys post pictures of like, oh, I got my buck aged at 12 or whatever. It's rare. But mm -hmm. you're like, man, he almost like looks like a three-year-old buck. Like yeah. They almost like go back kind of like we do, I guess. We kind of go from looking tough and big to kind of shrinking yeah. as we get old. Benjamin Button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's incredible though, man. That's a stud. That it was brutal. Austin Chandler killed a stud. I saw that. Uh, um, and I it would have been the coldest day of the year here. And it's just like insane conditions. But those deer, they gotta eat when it gets that cold, man. And it sucks to sit in, but yeah, it's off. crazy how deadly that can be. Yeah. Sitting yeah. For sure. Brutal cold. I'm glad I'm tagged out. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have yeah, to worry no, about it i know we talked about that earlier when i was on um working class on deer cast you're like we both got tags and i'm like yeah it's a little depressing though you know but you know that was because i had some other big deer roll, rolling around i wanted another tag but yeah yeah now i am glad that i tagged out in september and i was kind of sweating when i killed yeah yeah it's like man you know you can be out there even if it's cold you're down to a hoodie yeah. sometimes you know like when i shot my other buck in november i was like in a hoodie dragging him out i'm like this is nice so yeah. plus the family wouldn't be too keen on me hunting over christmas so i'm yeah. glad, glad it yeah. worked out. 
So anyway, man, you're a guest on the Whitetail Edge podcast. So what I want to do here is I want to, you know, you had a pretty successful season this year. I just want to kind of dive into that. And, um, you know, we talked about in the podcast that I did with you before, and I keep referring back to that. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go to the Working Class Bow Hunter and, and you can find um, find me on with Kurt on uh, Working Class on DeerCast. But um, where was I going with this? I was drawing a blank here. I'm a guest on your show and yeah, yeah, yeah. my season. <laughs> um, oh, crap. It's all good. It's early. I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> I'm still drinking my coffee. So my brain's still getting warmed up. I was too. But anyway, so that is a great podcast. You guys can go check that out. Um, but we were talking about, um, oh yeah, the evolution of, of a bow hunter and, mm -hmm. and kind of mentioning that you and I were probably still like kind of, and we were probably pretty similar to where we're at and um, our goals, our mindsets for the season. Like we had kind of mentioned that, you know, you and I are not going to let a four and a half year old 160, 165 walk by. He's going to get it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Whereas to, you know, Ben or Mark jury, that's not going to happen. They're going to let it walk. And um, so I just think it's kind of cool that, you know, I feel like you and I are on that same like mindset and, and goal list of what we're going to kill and what we're going after. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, like my mom this year, biggest deer she ever killed was like 120 incher. And then she jumps up to like a 172, which, you know, that does happen, but I do feel like it's important to take these steps. And, you know, like you see kids, they go out and their dads let them shoot 180, 190s at like 10 years old. And I'm like, no, you yeah. know, what happened for me when I was a kid, like I went and um i shot a bunch of does when i was little a, a button buck as my first archery deer mm -hmm. and you know there was like an evolution to where like my first actual buck was like 126 inch eight point you know like that's just how yeah. it was and it, i felt like the evolution that i had as a kid was perfect like yeah what, what i killed was like it couldn't be better but sure. um so anyway it feels like every single year that I see your pictures of what you take um, during the hunting season, it's just like they keep getting better and better. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. what? I mean, so I guess I just want to dive into your season. What happened? What'd you kill? Um, and it's not always rack size, but I'm seeing you kill ma very mature animals too. So just get yeah. into that with me, Kurt. Yeah. I, I do like that conversation of like the evolution of a bow hunter and, and, flukes happen right you know like i could have killed i could have killed a 180 my first year bow hunting and of course it'd be like everyone that it's just not realistic you know and it's it'd be lucky but i'd take it you know but i'm glad it didn't happen yeah and, um but yeah like maturity maturity over rack size because just like people you know you can be an old dude but not have like i don't know the genetic right it's like a, a five and a half year old buck can still be 120 you know, it's like, so, that's just how it shakes out sometimes. So yeah, I guess in most cases, we're always talking about mature deer and then the size of the rack on top of it is if that's easy to set your goals on, which I like, like, you know, I have a certain goal in mind that I want to break right now that I'm like looking for. And if I can't find that deer, then I hunt the most mature deer that I possibly can or go find one. If I don't have them where I'm at, you know, going back that here we go, going back to the deer cast podcast we did with you, we talked about like the hustle it takes to find properties to do what you want to do, whether that's put a food plot in or find a giant, you know, you have to hustle to find spots that allow for both of those. And hopefully the food plot eventually leads into growing a giant or attracting a giant. Right. Um, but no, man, my seat, my season was great. My goals were really, I had some deer in mind um, and some mature deer in mind. And of course, you know, the goal is like, Hey, if I can connect with one of those great, um, but I don't know like how much detail we want to get in, but I, I killed a really great, um, I, I still, I have his teeth. I need to get him aged. I'm thinking he was seven or eight and a half year old buck, just an old ancient heavy bodied buck. I killed him, um, on, in the afternoon on October the 8th. Um, was that was on like, your property? Nope. Nope. This was on uh just a, a piece that I hustled for. Like we talked yeah. in the last episode that just one that I do, um, I do a lot of work on the ground to be able to 
keep permission on the ground for the old time old timer that owns it. Okay. Um, so that worked out great. I had a, a big time food plot down in the bottom and that deer basically ate in that food plot and then basically used terrain features up to where I was sitting. Um, and I was sitting there between beans and the big time clover plot kind of, uh, I guess it'd be a transition area, but more of a terrain fe feature between the two, um, hoping a mature buck would move through there right. and it worked out. It was great. Yeah. You know, um, double on my first saddle kill ever, which I, is like, was fun. Yeah. Um, and I can knock that off my like experience checklist. Um, and then I actually killed a doe that morning on my own personal farm. I, my wife and I just bought our own little slice of 40 acres, um, and not really expecting it to be, um, a really great deer hunting farm. We bought it just to get our foot in the door on some ground, you know, what, what we could afford, what, you know, that's a whole nother podcast right there. But, um, so I killed a doe that morning there. And then I killed my buck the same afternoon on another piece of property. So that worked out amazing. Yeah, um, that's awesome. and then, uh, yeah, so I had another buck, another mature eight pointer that, um, I thought would do really well. And I had him on my radar and I had another deer, another mature buck on a different piece that I was hunting. I was kind of like split between the two deer. Um, the big eight pointer was, um, a smaller buck. He was the smaller of the two, but he was on my wife and I's farm. So he had more, he had a boost of sentimental like charge behind him. Of course. Yeah. Um, but I honestly, for a while, I thought he, he wasn't killable. One, I didn't know my ground. I yeah. bought not knowing anything about it. And, uh, it's only 40 acres. You know what I mean? And it's not a, it's not like, it's not the piece that you would look at and be like, that holds deer. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I thought my chances of killing him, I, I thought I could if I played my cards right. Um, but I didn't feel, honestly, at, at the time, knowing about him getting pictures of him late summer, I didn't feel that confident. Like, oh, yeah, this that buck's killable here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, he was on my radar. I actually let some of my other buddies hunt there. And I was like, hey, that buck's in there. He's 150, probably has an eight, a clean eight pointer. He's a stud. Crank him if he comes in. And I actually let some of my other buddies hunt there um, while I knew that deer was in there. And it never worked out. They ended up hunting other places. But um, yeah, long story short, just kind of I bounced around hunting that other buck. And then the other deer like seemed to like get more consistent. I actually did see him late October. I had him at 40 yards and he kind of skirted. I, I could have shot him mm -hmm. to clarify. I could have shot him, but I didn't feel right about it. Like he was kind of in the zone cruising for does. I could, I tried to stop him. He wouldn't stop. And I just let, I just let him go. I didn't even really put that much effort into it. And, uh, but I got to see him. I'm like, dude, he's an old mature stud. It was cool to see him like that. And then uh, I ended up shooting him November the 12th. Um, he was with a doe um, on my piece and mm -hmm. shot him and watched him fall. It was, it was pretty badass. That was a heck of a deer, man. Yeah. I'm thrilled with him. I'm thrilled. Yeah. Well, you should be. Is he at uh old barn right now? No, I actually have the rack here. I could go grab it if you want, yeah. but uh, you want me to grab it? Yeah, go grab it. I like it, man. It's uh, I've been, I, I feel like I've been doing this. I just did a podcast with Aaron Blisey from the fall and I'm like showing the guy or buck and stuff on camera here. <laughs> Yeah, for any of you that have not seen um, Kurt's deer, um, you can go over to Kurt Guyer on Instagram or um, Working Class Bow Hunter on Instagram if you guys haven't followed them or anything. Um, just a really, really nice deer. So here's the rack. So oh, he's yeah. like, he's 150 clean. Um, he's got 13. Which way we go? 13 and uh, one of his twos is 13 and eighth or 13 and two eighths. Man, he's got a frame on him. Yeah, he's he's nice, man. He's one of those bucks, like, forward. Yeah. He looks good, right? But he's not, like, whoa, huge. But just, like, when he would turn and you'd see his frame, it, it's... Those G2s are crazy long. Yeah. So, I I think he was a five-and-a-half-year-old buck based off the trail cam pictures I have. When I shot him, I thought, I like, man, he could be a four-and-a-half-year-old. But mm -hmm. I have some pictures of him, um, like, fresh out of velvet. And then a bunch, I have a, a ton of him on scrapes, man, a ton. And looking at those pictures, it's like no doubt that he's five and a half. 
But mm. when I shot him, I was like, God, this deer could be four and a half, but I, I don't, I don't think that he is. I think he's a five and a half year old. If I had to put money on it, I'd say he's five and a half, but you could probably argue that he's four. Those eights like that, man, those are the ones where they turn around and they start walking away and you're like, dang it. <laughs> and you see them twos going away from you and you're like, oh man. And one of the first pictures I have of him, um, we put, I played with some rope scrapes this summer and I have a picture of him hitting the rope scrape. It's weird because he's with a fawn. And then the next picture is like him in the distance. Cause I had like the camera at a 45 down the trail and it's him way off in the distance. And it just, he looks stupid. Like it's the classic big eight walking away from you photo. And you just like, Oh man, how big actually is that deer? So those are the ones that get you, man. Uh, as soon as they start walking away like that, like uh, this year I was, I had this uh, eight point that always hung out with the deer that I killed Mm -hmm. And I killed my deer on September 28th. So obviously, you know, they were still kind of bachelored up a little bit and uh, yeah. same deal, man, that, that he's a three-year-old I'm thinking, you know, it's the first time hunting that place, but eight point and he's just got a big old frame on him. So he's going to be a oh. stud next year. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. That worked out great, man. Good season, yeah. but that's what yeah, it's exciting. I the deer for next year is like such a good feeling when you got deer to look forward to. Yeah. So, yeah, you got some to look forward to this year or for next year. Yeah, I do. Um, one area I hunt, I feel like everything just got shot up. <laughs> like there's really no nice way to put it. It just seems like every mature deer, every deer up and coming got wounded or just blasted or is MIA since Illinois firearm season. It's like, uh, it's just for me, it, it's tough to see. Because yeah. I think as a bow hunter, when you dedicate so much time and then you have the guys that come in just ca super casually and then don't really, they don't have any time invested. There's no emotion invested. They almost like some of them are not, and this is controversial, but I would argue that a lot of like gun hunters that just gun hunt and don't put any time in, they almost lack empathy for the animal as a, as a living thing. Yeah. Whereas I feel like a bow hunter a guy who bow hunts and gun hunts or a guy who just bow hunts has a little more empathy and respect for the animal's life and livelihood and health and well-being. You know, of course, we're trying to kill them, so that sounds weird. But, I mean, if you're this far in on a hunting podcast, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it um, sounds weird to an outsider for sure. but it, I, it does sound weird, but we want deer to be healthy, fully mm -hmm. mature, and then shoot them, you know. And so to see, right, but it's also like. It's like a farmer you know yeah, getting, it his, is. getting his cattle ready and I, i'm talking to i'm talking to 99.9 .9 hunters right now so we don't even need to elaborate but it's like trophy hunting is selective hunting and that's yep. beneficial to everything but yeah everything just in one area just got you know bullet holes blasted through it all and then now i'm kind of like gah we'll see like it's just been a ghost town and uh you know another piece i got some bucks that are that all i feel like most of the deer that i d didn't hunt or backed off of made it and then another piece is we'll see you know i know there's deer there that travel through we'll see who makes their home uh there next year yeah um you know i i always had like a bigger piece of property to hunt whether that be you know a bigger lease that i was paying for or big permission spots and again, re referring back to that podcast I did with you, and we kind of touched on this and talked about it was how I kind of switched my focus to these smaller pieces. And, um, you know, I'm talking properties that are 10 acres or less. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of weird, like, you know, obviously, it's a goal for a lot of us to own a big piece of land. Mm -hmm. As a hunter, you know, you just want to you want to have that big piece of land where you have it all to yourself. You can put your food plots in and all this. And obviously that's a big dream, but it's like after this year and what I've, what I've seen was, you know, doing a lot of glass in this past summer driving, trying to find something to kill, running a ton of cameras, casting a huge net mm -hmm. is what I'm doing and just trying to find something felt like I was increasing my odds with every property I picked up, which I was. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and then I turn around and um, it was hard not to be a little bit jealous of what um, what Ben had uh, on his farms. Obviously, Ben has worked his butt off to get um, what he's got. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not like a, 
you know, it's just like, man, I wish, you know, I had a property and yeah. you know, not to think those thoughts. Right. Um, but then again, I turn around and do I have a ton invested in food plots and um, deer that I've known for years? No, I don't, because every year's turnover for me and I'm trying to find another one. As no, to I where- think most people have that, I think that's probably like the norm for guys that are hunting permission pieces or yeah. leases. Well, that's that's something else I want to talk to you about too. But um, we'll get back to that. But um, just like seeing what Ben has, and obviously it's hard not to be a little jealous of it. But then again, it's like I tagged out, so I'm done, and I'm just gonna wait until um this spring summer yeah. to try to find another deer to kill, uh, a deer that I don't even one three year old I have on my mind, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so then I turn around and I see half of ben's herd get taken out by ehd and then after that after that big bout of ehd he's sending me trail cam videos of deer running by dying on this trail camera running past the trail camera from shotgun season from neighbors mm. and it's like man these landowners deal with a lot and I, and honestly it's like yeah you know i you see mark jury there's just the frustration of uh the diseases and the neighbors and stuff like that like um you know maybe it's not all sunshine and rainbows obviously it's yeah not. I, yeah no there's always i mean not everything's a positive right it's great to own all that ground but once you own it it's like you're locked into it i guess or, or, or you know i guess for me if i owned if i bought 200 acres or bigger I'm stuck to that 200 acres unless I sell it or flip it or do something and get another piece. But I mean, yeah, there's frustrations, especially like if you're a guy who owns a chunk of ground and you're killing big deer on it because you've done the work and you figured it out and it big deer, like we've brought this up a ton, big deer bring the worst out in people. And they, it, it does it's in, you know, I, I even have issues with it too. And I'm killing good deer. I'm killing mature deer, but I'm not killing 200 inch deer, you know, but even, but I I think this too, and this is, man, there's so many directions we could just branch off and go this right now. I I think people outside the Midwest or just people even in the Midwest, most people don't kill 150s every year. I would say most people don't kill 130s every year. And I'm talking most people like take the hunting, the bow hunting population, break it down. Most guys aren't killing 130 inch deer every year. They're not even doing that. So you get a guy that kills a 140 every year that consistently, that's exceptional. Like that guy's doing something. And then all the guys who don't kill the 130s every year, see the guy who kills the 140s every year. And they're like, well, hell, like hell, how's he doing it? Must be his property. Let's get as close to that guy's line as we can. Let's, let's talk to that landowner and see if we can get him kicked off that permission. We can get on there. Oh, that's my 48th cousin, 45 times removed. Hey, I'm family. So and so's hunting in there, and I saw they kill a good deer. Can I hunt it? And that's like, I, I those are rare cases, but maybe they're not as rare anymore. Leases are tough. Like people are getting kicked off leases because of stuff like that. Where, you know, I just think it's, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying not to go too deep into this, but yeah. I know pieces of ground that you look at it and you see certain guys hunting it and. You just know they're doing the wrong moves and they're figuring it out. Right. But you're like, man, I know that piece holds deer. You take the right guy and put him in there. He's going to kill the biggest buck that lives in there. Yep. You know, um, that might be controversial. Thinking, Maybe probably the, rude. What's that? That might sound a little rude, I guess, but, no, I, but I, what I'm getting at is people would rather just try and get the good farm. They think than actually figure out how to hunt the deer on their own farm and put in the time for it so it's just like this weird jealousy thing that happens but because of that too another thing i try to do and i've just kind of like realized i do this like passively the last couple years i've always had a lease or a permission piece or something not my whole life but the last few years i and i grew up hunting one sole piece of ground and that was all i had and kind of you said if like something happened if ehd hit it I was screwed for how long? Three years? You know, um, the neighbors put the crazy pressure. They shoot the buck I'm hunting. That stuff happens. Then I got to wait, you know, and I got one piece. Well, I think the smart thing to do, kind of like what you alluded to, is like even if they're 10-acre pieces, 
a, a five acre piece. If you can, if as a, as a one person, two acre piece, if you can get three different pieces to hunt, even if it's three 10 acre pieces or whatever, what I think you can do is have your spot where, you know, you want to save for the right moves, have your uh, scratch your itch spot where you just want to go hunting and the likelihood of killing is probably not that great, but you don't want to pressure a farm when it's not the right time or a piece that's not the right time for whatever the situation is, terrain, weather, wind, all that, all that crap. Go to the scratch your itch farm is what I call it. It's where it's like, I'm going to go sit here. It's easy to get in. I'm not bumping nothing. I'm hunting, scratching my itch, feel good about it. Didn't mess nothing up. And you can use that and then hunt your farms where you think the highest odds are. You can hunt those effectively on the days you need to be in there. And even if the scratch your itch farm is two acres and you don't think you're going to kill anything there, you could, you know? So does that make sense? Kind of like you can have three properties in your circle. And, and for the record, I share properties. Like these aren't all just like, Hey, go have free rain. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, I share properties to be able to do this or to be able to make it work. But I think if guys could do that, get your 10 acre piece, if you can get a lease or, and then hunt your distant family farm, you know, I'm just throwing random examples out there. I think unless you own ground, like that's that rotation of three properties is a really good sweet spot to be in. Yeah. And I just had this conversation with a buddy yesterday. So it's kind of funny that you bring it up, but the same deal is like, um, you know, it, it's like, I don't know how, but people just don't understand that method though. Like, no, no, they think, they think the more hours you log in the same tree stand, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I used to be that way. I used to be that way. I did too. But, um, you know, and, and then these people, they don't understand why you're being successful or why you're, why you're killing this. And then people start talking and you like, um, you know, the past three bucks I've killed in Ohio, we're all on different properties. Mm-hmm. Um, I had, I don't know how many permission, I, I lost count of how many permission spots I got. Um, you know, so like I said, just going back to casting that big net and then looking at what my family did this year, all those deer were killing different properties. My mm-hmm. parents own 36 acres. That's it. That's all that our family owns. That's it. That's where my mom killed her deer. And my brother killed um, his deer where we only have permission on an ag field. And there's just a, an old timber draw that runs through it. That's it. Mm-hmm. The woods. We can't really move around. We're hunting in a draw. Yeah. Dad killed on a six and a half acre piece. I killed on a two acre piece. So I love it. Just, yeah, I mean, so just going back to to casting that big net and whether it happened in my family or not, or pe- even people I know, that should just go to show these everybody that's listening to this that it doesn't matter how big that property is. Cast that big net, go get as much permission as you can that butts mm-hmm. into good stuff. It doesn't have to be 150, 200 acre woods. It doesn't have to be no. 80 acres. As long I, as- sorry, I... I just, I got a thought in my head and it just started to come out. (laughs) Just one second here, but yeah, as long as it butts in to something good, or you can see some kind of feature that's coming off of that good farm that you really want, Mm -hmm. but it's got this finger running off of the, the Southeast corner and it's running right into that 10 acre block that no one hunts. Yeah. That's behind a, an old junkyard. Go get it. Yeah. I, yeah, for sure. I think it's overlooked spots, you know, and I think even that cycle of three properties, even if you're just a public guy and you don't care about hunting private cycle, three properties, you can, or have, even if you're a guy who d- doesn't hunt public and you have a couple small permission pieces, use the scratch your itch spots as like a, the nearest piece of public. I want to hunt. I just want to go. I, I just, I just need, I, cause I get that. I get that every year. Go out to that scratch your itch, do your thing. But it's, um, yeah, it's tough. It's, I don't know. There's a whole lot to it, but I, I feel like a lot of guys will get to a point and like we're talking about like climbing the ladder, the evolution of a bow hunter. And I feel like I got, I, I kind of hit the first big step in like buck killing and I got stuck there for three, four years. Like, you know, I grew up hunting a piece that was mostly timber with a, like two draws in it. 
the entry and exit was the only thing I had. It was kind of tough to get in and out. And I didn't know any different to try and find another piece, didn't know where to start. And I just hunted this piece. And like we said, hunted as much as I could in the piece to just create an opportunity. I'd get an opportunity once a year. And then if I didn't kill on that, I, I was pretty much done. I, I felt, but, and then I felt like I, I killed a couple of good deer in there, a few good deer hit a plateau and just got stuck there. And I feel like I was stuck there from like, I don't know, I'd say 2012 to like 2015. I was just kind of plateaued, killed two good deer in that time frame off that piece. What do you mean? And, I mean what was going on? Like you were just not figuring them out. You you think you were hunting mm, too much? Like were, was it you making mistakes or? I think it was. So I killed a really good buck in 2012. Um, by far my biggest buck at the time. And I feel like, I don't know if I got cocky. I was young, you know, I would have been, um, 10 years ago. What's that? 10 years ago. Yeah. So I would have been, I don't know, 22. Yeah. I was 22. Killed a really good buck. Um, I don't know if I got cocky in my head or I was like, man, I did this. I don't even need to look for another piece. This, this piece produced. And then I just kind of like, I don't know if I got sloppy. I can't really recall, but it's like, I feel like it was a mindset thing. And then I went a few years without killing a good buck, was on good deer, um, but didn't kill one. And then I killed another really good buck in 2015. And then I feel like once I killed that deer, I started paying attention more to like how wind works, how wind works to my advantage and the deer's advantage, terrain, entry and exit. So I kind of hit that new level of like understanding of big deer. Just aha moment, huh? Uh, yeah and then i've been more consistent since then and then it, it like then i got to that point and then i feel like just like the last two seasons i hit the next level of like okay understanding like the pressure i'm putting on the deer and then more about terrain like you understand those things you start to figure out a little further okay. and then you kind of go into another like you shift gears and go a little further and now i'm in that like second gear i love this the third gear yeah, so I don't know where I'm at now. I just know I like to hunt and I like to kill deer. And I think the next shift of gear is finding a deer that hits that. Uh, I don't know how to word this. Like the next exception and the the next exceptional genetic, like finding a buck like 180 plus. Like you're killing mature deer. Now it's to find a mature deer that has an insane rack on its head. And that's just luck at that point. Like, you know, you have to find that deer, then go after him. Yeah, you definitely can't kill them if they're not there. But yeah, right. I'm so glad that you talked about those steps because it's it's almost like hard to explain that, I guess. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that I, I like I feel that way because I remember a deer that I killed in 2018, you know, which wasn't really that long ago I, or 2016. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, I killed this deer and it was like something clicked. You know, I watched this deer all summer long and I killed him on opening day. And then I was mm -hmm. with my buddy filming, you know, uh, it was awesome. I'll never yeah. forget that. He was just 135 inch eight point, but that Still. deer, he was like everything, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was one of the most memorable deer I think I've ever killed with my buddy there and, you know, able to figure him out on opening day. And I felt like Mark Jury for a second, you know, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just got to do it. Hey. So, you know, I figured some things out that year that clicked for me. And then, you know, following the next two years, I figured out a little bit more and a little bit more. Right. And, you know, definitely don't have everything figured out still, still learning. Um, but gosh, it's like the past couple of years, I felt like I've learned so much following Ben around. Mm -hmm. Just surrounding yourself with, you know, you, you are who you hang with. So hang with some killers. Like you hang with you hang with Austin Chandler and and Ross, yeah. and you don't even have have to hang out with these guys personally. Like I said, you can you, you know you can go listen to podcasts where Ben Rising is and where Mark mm -hmm. Jury is, Lee Lakoski, and all these guys. You can go pretty much hang with them virtually. Um, That's a good point, man. Because there's so much truth to that. Like you know, as I really growing up, I did I had I all my deer hunting buddies were 20 years older than me. Like they were all, you know, my dad's buddies that we knew, like where I grew up just hunting with. I was, I was the 21 year old, the tw the 18 year old in deer camp drinking beers with the, you know, the 40, 45 and older guys. 
and just kind of trying to fit in and deer hunting with them and watching all these guys kill bucks. And I'm just figuring, trying to figure it out still. Um, and then I didn't, I never really had a, a, cl- a close deer hunting group my age really until right around the time we started working class bow hunter just a touch before. And I met Ross and Austin and Clark Cummings and some killers like that locally because of the podcast and then met Ross. Ross at the time had a little bow shop that he was doing like side work on. And I bought a bow off him for my wife and went in there and then like end up hitting it off with Ross. They came in, did the podcast, whatever. And I remember telling my wife on the way home from Ross's bow shop, I'm like, I want to surround myself with more people like that. And ever since then, that's what I've done. And fortunately enough, like I became best friends with our whole crew. And that honestly in itself is probably the reason for a lot, like uh, speeding up my evolution as a bow hunter. How long would it have took if I would have been on my own? I, I don't know. I still could be stuck in that first shift, you know, if it wasn't for surrounding myself around killers, yeah. you know? Yeah even if they're not like declarated killers say they're on the same level as you Um, have to be passionate. Yeah. Pat, a guy that's passionate about it, that's going out and, you know, he is doing things as smart as possible, Mm -hmm. but you guys can go hunt and you can bounce ideas off each other. Now, now you're compiling data, what's working, what's not working. And eventually it's going to work out for you. And you guys are both going to sharpen each other. Iron sharpens iron. So my dad and I did that a long time, you know, like that's something I'm, I'm from in this episode, I'm not giving enough credit to you. my dad and I started bow hunting. He bow hunted a few years. He's hunted his whole life, you know, he did, you know. And then, but he only seriously bow hunted for deer just a couple years longer than I did because of like what the age, you know, I was a little young um to start the same time he did. But my dad and I helped each other, you know, big time in our evolution. Like, you know, we shaved a lot of trial and error off each other's experiences for a long time and then even like you know meeting ross and austin and eric and doug and like getting real close to those guys you know my dad's hunting even evolved from there too you know what i mean so just having people that are passionate around you is a good way to keep learning and stay motivated to learn um, if you don't have that, it's not, and, and we get messages from people who listen that are like, man, I don't have any friends that are into hunting like I am. And your guys' show is like where I go to like, hang out with the boys. And that's like the best message of all time, mm-hmm. you know? And it's also, I kind of feel well, that was your I, whole mission, wasn't it? I mean, really? I mean, essentially be like that hunting camp. Yeah. Like it in- evolved to that. Right. Like yeah. it didn't start as that it, it did. It did. But I didn't realize the impact that it might have for some people at first. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, shit, that is a great mission to like be that hunting camp for guys who don't get to have that hunting camp. Yeah. Um, so it evolved into that. And I'm like, man, that makes you feel good when you get a message like that. So even if it's three people that think that way, that's still worth it, you know, because man, I can, I can only imagine even like when there's guys that want to go on hunting trips and don't have a buddy to commit with them or a buddy that'll like make the plans and then back out on them that they can't rely on. Then right. that bums me out bad. You know, it's like, Hey, let's go, let's go hunt elk together. Yeah, dude, for sure. And that comes to plan and your buddy flakes out on you. Cause he's a, a wussy, you know what I mean? So I don't know. That's why we do some of these bear hunting camps, like come hunt with us. Right. Yeah, no, that's super cool. And like the Africa thing, but just like what you were saying is, these people that reach out to you about um, it being like hunt camp and that has since you've kind of evolved, I guess, into your guys's mission and you guys make it, you know, that fun hunt camp atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Well, Ben's biggest goal in white tail edge was uh, to teach you to be a better hunter. Mm-hmm. And uh, just while you were talking there, I pulled up this email and cause we get these messages all the time, but this guy um, emails Ben and said, just wanted to say a huge thank you to you. I've watched all your videos that I can find. I wrote down notes on how to make and hunt scrapes. Also, I took notes on how and when to use Black Widow deer scents. I have two years of history with this deer and now have pictures and videos of him destroying those scrapes. His name is Triple Crown. And on Saturday, December 17th at 410, I was able to harvest him. Without you, sir, I could not have ever killed him. Thank you. And you're correct. Jesus is king. And then he sends 
dang yeah but that's awesome it ben gets those messages all the time and i know that's like such a um a motive a motivator for for ben that bucks a hammer yeah that's a, that's the best message you can get you know and um you know so those definitely outweigh the uh, the negative comments and um just what oh, yeah what ben is able to put out there and you know geez i wish he i wish he could have got on here with us but and he for all me. of you uh for all of you wondering like geez i thought ben was going to be hosting this podcast too it's just that um ben is a busy fella and hey, uh, you guys are a team so it's like that's yeah. why I, I i do 99 percent of the hosting on working class on deercast mm-hmm. just it's a team man we work together we get it done so well, it's just like well would you rather like just not have a podcast you want me to wait until me and ben can align our schedules you know so no i love it you gotta be you gotta be able to do that as a team man like so for people who don't understand that's just how it works like we have that sub series cc hunt files it's you know evolve it's its own podcast but we just it's under our umbrella you know clint hosts that that was supposed to be originally it was kurt and clint hunt files now it's the Clint Casper CC hunt files because I just can't do another one every week. <laughs> yeah. How's, how's Clint liking that? Good. He's just a year in. Um, he's doing good. He's figuring it out. Um, I think he went through a rough, a rocky patch of like, uh, cause he's always been a guest on shows. Yeah. He's never been the host on shows. So it's hard for Clint to remove himself out of the guest seat and only stay in the host seat. Cause he gets so passionate and excited he tends to like answer, ask the question, then answer the question for the guest. And, uh, but he's gotten some really good feedback. Uh, people have been great, like knowing that he's learning how to become the host. I think he's really enjoying it and having fun with it. Um, but he's finding his groove. Just, I mean, yeah, man, you got to think like we found our groove, took us, I don't know how long to find our groove, and we're still probably finding it to a point. And then we throw him on our platform that already has like, a, a very fair amount of downloads every month and then he's just getting criticized from the rip you know and i'm like dude you gotta remember you you hit the ground running rather than like building it up and then have people like evolve with you like so yeah he, he's doing great i love that series he can do a lot with that series you know going west the mule deer the elk stuff that you know he can do it from experience more than we can yep. so i think it's a perfect fit and i'm excited to watch that series grow yeah yeah, you're targeting a whole other crowd there, you know. Like I personally like nothing against that, but I I just don't want to like necessarily listen to mule deer talk and elk talk just because I'm so whitetail focused. But that's just me, and I know there's a lot of people that do want to listen to all of it. But you know, yeah. but I have listened to Clint and his podcast, and it's good. I'll tell you this: it's a lot of guys think the way you think, and then a lot of guys are so curious about mule deer and elk that you know i see just from numbers i see that of course what we people relate more because the majority of our audience is where we're at and then but i do see like the increase in the traffic on cc hunt files is getting better and better um but i'll get to there's stories out there that working class bow hunter wcb as, as a series alone can't cover it all or might not have the know-how on the best way to cover it. And that's where Clint kind of fills that gap for the Western stuff. Actually, I do think back to one of my favorite podcasts. I think I ever heard on, on yours was um, that cemetery mule deer book. Yeah. With Devin Leonard. Yeah. Oh, was that Devin? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That was one of my favorite uh, podcasts. I think I've ever listened to honestly. And that <laughs> what's funny about that episode. We did that the first year we were in bear camp out in Wyoming we recorded that in a canvas wall tent, which is cool. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of like, uh, hey, dude, I know you killed this like insanely large mule deer. You want to do a podcast on it? And Devin was like, I guess, you know, like he wasn't even like, yeah, let's do it. He's like, I guess we could. Yeah. So if I think if I remember right, he wasn't like <clears throat> the Devin Leonard that you hear on these other podcasts, though, right? He was a little more reserved or. Well, it it's been a yeah. while since I listened to that podcast. I just know I liked it a lot. We had known Devin for like 24 hours at that point. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I had known Devin in person for 
less than 24 hours at that time, but I had talked to Devin a ton on the phone and stuff like, like I knew Devin, but I didn't know Devin. Right. You know, now it's different. Like I'm going to Mexico with Devin in three weeks. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, we're like, we're going hunting again. Like him and I are, we kind of have this thing where like when we're together, things tend to die. <laughs> and so we have like these little traditions we're making, um, together and hunting camp and stuff. So yeah, he's, I, I consider one of my best friends. Yeah. You think he's pretty uh bit by the white tail bug? Uh, Devin is bit by anything he can hunt bug, but yeah, he is. Yeah. He, he has an interesting but he's an interesting cat because it he's a big buck killer. Like when it comes to mule deer, he is the guy. Mm -hmm. And if he can't find a buck where he's hunting at a certain point that interests him to hunt, he just goes with his buddies. Like who does that, man? He's like the best dude on the planet. He will help his buddies kill the deer they want to kill. Whether or not he thinks it's a big buck or not, he's always helping his friends hunt. Always. And so that's why I'm like thankful he gets to come here and like we can share our world with them and he's killed some deer and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's bit by the whitetail bug pretty bad. It's kind of weird to think about, um, you know, just how much different our lives like your life was than Devin was growing up and just yes. like, you know, your white tail and mule deer and just how different that probably is. And then oh, yeah. imagine like, you know, as a white tail guy, you can, you can imagine going out West and killing a mule deer. You've done it. Mm -hmm. But I have like that picture in my head of what that would be like. So, but it is hard for me to picture what a mule deer guy coming to kill a white tail would be like. And just that's so different. It's yeah. funny because when they're in camp, you know, they were in town for a while. Um, you know, him, Trey Heiner, our buddy Marcus were all in town. They're all, you know, Devin and uh, Marcus are from Utah, the same area in Utah. Trey's a Western Wyoming boy. Like they have, I mean, he sees there's whitetail there, but they're not hunting them. You know, right. they're like river bottom animals and they're not, I mean, I'm sure there's some big ones, whatever, but you know, it's that always gets brought up in those shows why they're here. It's like, it always gets into com compare and contrast. Like what, what do you guys think? You know, because that perspective for me is so interesting. It's like, are these, is a whitetail interesting to you because you get Devin and Trey together and they watch more 200 plus inch mule deer die than a lot of guys, you know, like, that's what they go for. They're going for that 200 inch mark or 180 or better. And but most times they're looking for 200s or bigger. And it was like, is it interesting to come out here and try and kill a 130 inch whitetail? And yeah. they well, are. You're gonna, you're gonna find out, right? Because you're gonna go hunt coos deer. Right. So, I'm going hunt coos deer, but you know, but, but I don't see Kurt Geyer getting addicted to coos deer hunting and hunting. And moving to Mexico or wherever you're going and being a diehard coos. <laughs> no, no, but and, and that coos deer hunt is gonna be a rifle hunt, which mm -hmm. I am excited for, honestly. Like I've killed two animals with a rifle, and both times, both times I've really enjoyed it. Um, but here's let me I want to clarify this because I don't know if I've really talked about this in detail anywhere else. Yeah, working class bow hunter is our brand. Um, we got some other things coming under our umbrella, but you know, I think rifle hunting in the Midwest would feel very wrong to me personally. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm saying to me, it would feel wrong yeah. because it would I just, I just you, don't... Just, you just got to see them yeah. <laughs> out West. It, it is a different ball game. You know, I've killed, I've killed one mule deer with a rifle in Oregon. I've killed a mule deer, velvet mule deer with my bow in Wyoming um, both tough hunts. I did. I bow hunted in Oregon too, and then killed one with a rifle. Um, I killed an elk with a rifle in Wyoming and you still, you're still working for it, right? You're still busting your tail. Um, I don't feel it'd be nearly as fun or intriguing here in the Midwest for a whitetail. Now I, Devin invited me on this coos deer hunt in Mexico. And I was kind of like, nah, you know, that's cool. I want one day I'd like to do it, but I don't know. He invited me last year and I would have had to left ATA and went straight to Mexico. Well, then he invited me again this year and I'm like, I'd like to go. He goes, I was like, if I can leave like a week after ATA, I, I would go if, if it works out. Well, Devin owns Hunter's box club. I don't know. I've told this story on the podcast, made me a deal. 
We did a promo with Working Class Bow Hunter and Hunter's Box Club. He goes, hey, I'll make you a deal. We sell 100 more boxes. I'll pay for your tag, and you can come down and hunt with me. I'm like, okay, cool. So I was like, if we sell them, then I'll go. So Devin says that on the podcast, We and shout out to everybody that, that subscribed to the Hunter's Box Club. We just blew that number out of the water, and he called me. He's like, well, you're going to Mexico. So I'm like, okay, I'll go. So right after ATA, we're flying down and – going hunting coos deer with a rifle i'm excited in mexico right in mexico yeah so yeah like going back to a coos deer like our goal right now not knowing 100 percent like the ranch we're going to be on our goal right now not knowing is 110 or better okay so i've heard some uh my uncle went to mexico for a white tail hunt before and um heard some crazy stories down there yeah <laughs> I know. That's why I was kind of like, ah, I don't know if I'm about all that. Yeah. But you know, Joe, Joe miles, um, Osseo gear owner. He just, he just got back from Mexico. looks like they had a great time and no problem. So maybe it's just all about where you're at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Devin's had his, his experiences and stories. We were going to get into some of those stories on the podcast, but he was kind of like, I'd rather not like, not, not that like anything, it's not anything that they're doing. It's just like what is around them. Right. So yeah. I'm like, that's fair. So I, I don't think I'll have a problem talking about it. We'll see. We'll see. I'll, I I will definitely be open about my experiences. Yeah. It'll be interesting, man. I think, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, um, just, just experiencing and something new, you know, but, um, yeah. One thing I wanted to talk to you about before we uh before we close out here was can you hear the baby or no? Yeah, man. Oh, uh, not really. I, I heard a little bit when you looked, but otherwise I probably wouldn't have even noticed. Um and no, I'm not ignoring the baby. My wife's on it. So <laughs> that'd be great. It'd be great if you were like, Yeah, that baby's crying over there. So I could should pick it up, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway, um one thing I wanted to talk to you about was you know, now that I've started a podcast and um, one of the reasons why we did that was just because I wanted to get some more content out there for the white tail edge people. Um, I think Ben is excellent for it. All the knowledge he has. Um, that was one of the reasons. And then another reason was just because I am a fan of podcasts. I've become passionate about it myself. Um, whether or not I'm a good host or not, I don't know. We'll figure it. We'll figure it out. But um, one thing you I it, dude. you do a good job. Thank you. One thing I wanted to talk to you about was how ahead of the game you were. And I don't know what would even possess you to want to start a podcast when you did. Was it 15? Um, it, like Yeah, it, we, we started and launched early 2015. Um, I was creating all the pages and website and all that stuff. Like in November, I was actually looked at last night for some reason. It's funny you asked. November of 2014 is when I made like all our pages. Okay. And so, so dude, I didn't even know what a podcast was then. So yeah, yeah, I honestly, we should have launched in October of 2014. Cause I was talking about it before season of 2014 when it started. And I wish I would have launched that early, but I, we weren't ready. You know, was there any hunting podcast? Yeah. Um, there was like a handful, like when I would type it in on like iTunes or whatever was at the time there was, and, and if you're a podcast that somehow hears me talk about this, I'm not talking shit, but there was just a handful in there, like maybe four. I don't even remember the names of them. They're very, to me at the time I was 24. That's how long ago this was, you know? And yeah. like, so I'm like, man, what's this? You know, kind of knew about it because of that. Looked up hunting podcasts, and it was more like radio podcast crossover type stuff, and just boring, kind of like uptight, and nothing that I wanted to listen to as a rambunctious like 24 year old that was like kind of nuts a little bit, you know? Yeah. So I mean, I bet I'm I, I'm just sure that you had no idea what it was going to turn into. I mean. No, I did like small little film. Is that stuff. even the goal, or was it just something to do as fun? Um, both kind, both kind of. But um, in my head, I knew I wanted to do something outdoor industry related and see how far I could take that. Uh, you know, I always thought like TV and being I, being a videographer was like 
that's what you had to do to get into the industry. And because for the longest time, dude, like we had this podcast that we started and, and winged it and got whatever gear we could afford. And like now I'm using stuff made for podcasting. Like, it's so easy. You just plug it all together and it works. Like, then it was like, I wasn't even using the right equipment and $20 mics for like the first year. And then we slowly like progressed. But no, it was never like a goal to be like, we're going to be this podcast and like everyone's going to be like, well, check it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, um, we had fun, right? Yeah. Certainly something to be proud of, man. And you've, I know Thank you've you. paid your dues. Thanks, um, man. Yeah. So I respect that. It was just, I think it's just fascinating that like you were so like ahead of things, you know, like how you figured that out. Because like I said, I didn't even know what a podcast was until I don't know, 18. Oh dude. You know, and I don't know how much time I got left, but I do, I do want to just say this because it's like, once we got going and like, do you go like all those pod? I think the, all the podcasts that we've done are up except like maybe the first two. And that's only because, um, like when we first recorded, it's like one guy would be in your right speaker and one dude would be in your left speaker. It's like actively learning as we were just full, like we we're just sending it, going for it. Um, but the first three years, all we did was promote what podcasts were. And then by the time we got to promoting what we were, people are already done listening to us and they're like, oh, cool. All right. And I was like, oh, now they know what a podcast is, but I didn't get to finish my pitch and tell them what our show was and what we were about. So the first three years, that's what we did. We tried to get guests on and a lot, we got a lot of great guests early on and they were awesome and understanding, but a lot of people and companies were like, what? No, we're not doing that. So now it's funny to see like, however many years later, now everybody's got a podcast and everybody needs to have a podcast in their eyes. I don't think, I don't feel that way. Um, but it's just funny to see where it started to where it's at and then all the growth and ups and downs and judgment we've had during yeah. that process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys were um, something that the industry has never seen before, you know, the way that you guys cut up with each other and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that was kind of like uh, mystical art or something, you know, like taboo. And well, in the yeah, industry perspective wise, I think we weren't um we weren't very highly respected for a long time. And I'm not maybe we're still not. I don't know. I'm not saying that we are respected. I, I, I like I hope so, but also I don't care. Right. Really. You know what I mean? Like it's nice to be like Mark Drury thinks I'm cool. Psh, high five, you know? <laughs> that, that's a good feeling, you know. Yeah. But like, also too, it's like, we've always just done what we've done. And if like a company wanted to work with us for it and understood why, like, and we've had great companies that jumped on board and we've done work for companies, which is awesome. Like that's how we can do what we do for free <laughs> and do it. Um, but two, for a long time, even if it wouldn't have gone that route, we'd still, I would, I think we'd still be doing it. Maybe not to the the frequency that we're doing it now, but um, yeah, for, we were basically the wild west for a long time until more podcasts started to kind of do what we were doing. So um, yeah, people probably hated us for a long time for it. So we just talk about how we, whatever we want to talk about. Yeah. Still I mean, you guys were, uh, I don't know. You just always kept it authentic. It seemed like, and um, <clears throat> I don't know whether you, uh, whether you, whether you do cuss a lot or, or drink beer or whatever, I think it was, you know, like I, I try to watch my tongue. I don't drink or anything like that. So um, nothing against that. I'm just, it's just, I don't, um, yeah. but, but for me, I respect that you guys keep it real and you, you yeah. are, you are who you are just like uh, I try to be, I try to be authentic. I know Ben tries to be authentic. Um, that's, that's kind of what rubs me wrong is when someone is completely different. Like yeah. you're going to, like people that are not being themselves and they turn into this whole other person because they're in the, some kind of spotlight that is like, I don't know. I like someone that's genuine. So I got to say, I appreciate what you guys did and have done. Thanks, and man. Do. Thank so. you, man. It, you know, I, I think for a long time, because we were wild, it ruined our credibility as deer hunters as like serious deer hunters. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing too. It's like, we say a lot of stuff on our podcast because like, you know, when you're with your boys and you're in hunting camp or you're just hanging out with your friends in the garage and you say stuff 
we do this a lot. You say stuff you don't mean because it's funny or yeah. to create fun conversation. That's what we do. And like I do it a lot. Then you just put it on the internet where it lives forever. <laughs> yeah, where it lives forever, you know. And then I'll have to go and explain that one day. Like, you know, I don't think we'll ever be mainstream. But if I was like, if we were a mainstream industry, oh, dude, you'd see me like Liver King on there. Me, I'm like, hey, listen, I lied. I should have said. <laughs> Kirk guy <are> exposed. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Like, if you don't know that I'm kidding when I say some stuff, that I clearly don't mean it when we're cutting up. Like, we're having fun. Yeah. Nah, we're not the podcast for you then don't listen yeah and that's that's another big thing is like you guys have kept it genuine but you guys have also seemed to have so much fun and yeah you know, that's hard not to like envy and want some more of that you know like it's just fun to have fun with your boys yeah nothing wrong with that's it just like any about. looking back at hunting camp when i was when i was young that's one thing that i miss a lot you know Obviously, I take things a lot more serious than I used to when I was younger um, mm -hmm. in the hunting because my goals have changed and whatnot. But um, looking back at that hunting camp, um, you know, I miss that a lot. I miss check-in stations. And um, I was talking to my brother. He got a lease in Oklahoma, and uh, he was taking his 11-year-old uh, boy out there, my nephew Connor, and uh, they were going to have, like, that hunt camp. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, I was like, Connor's going to love that. You know, like, that's what oh, yeah. To see um you know i don't know just the experiences you have out there are unforgettable um yeah that, well that that's what i do miss a lot is the camaraderie and playing poker and you know eating chili sure. and farting well yeah farting cussing <laughs> burping like that's yeah. what but that's like the cool thing about what podcasts and i feel like that's why the podcast space is blossomed to what it is in the hunting industry because you take one of the most fun parts of hunting culture and just made an excuse to do it every week. And then you just put it out there and people can hang out with you virtually, you know? Yep. So I, you know, I can't believe that it didn't really catch on sooner, but it, you know, radio and podcast kind of the same space, but not, but I'm surprised there wasn't already 500 hunting podcasts in 2014 when we started, you know? Yeah. Hey, dude, you were ahead of the game. Genius. I don't know. I think it's luck. But I'll take that. <laughs> well, was, anyway, man, uh, I, can't, I can't thank you enough for hopping on here with me, man. It was a fun conversation. Thanks for having uh, me, man. Yeah. So um, you guys go check out Working Class Bow Hunter. Um, if you haven't listened to their podcast, um, I think you're in for a, uh, a little adventure with them boys. It's yeah. A fun conversation always. Uh, Don't just, have your kids in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Pleather of, uh, well, uh, the Deercast one, that's pretty clean. Your cast is 100% clean. That launches every Monday. Family friendly. Um, but um, yeah, dude, thank you. Um, you can find Kurt on Instagram, Facebook, Kurt Geyer, uh, Working Class Bow Hunter, and then um, obviously on uh, Apple and Spotify. And, and Deercast. Deercast, yep. So um, thanks again, man. Appreciate you. Later, man.